So ladies and gentlemen, good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Jaime Correa, an associate professor in practice at the School of Architecture of the University of Miami, and the coordinator of this lecture series. On behalf of the Dean of the School of Architecture of the University of Miami and Technoglass, uh, our sponsors, I would like to welcome Marina Tabasum to the Spring Technoglass Honor Lecture Series of 2021. But before we start, let me remind you to keep your microphones off at all times. If you're attending this lecture for the sake of continuing education credits, please acknowledge your presence through an email to Professor Steve Fett at sfettsfett at miami.edu. Professor Steve Fett at sfett at miami.edu. At the end of Marina lecture, uh, Marina's lecture, we will have a question and answer session led by professors Charlotte von Moss and Melody Sanchez. Now, Marina Tawasum is a Bangladeshi architect who is practicing from Dhaka. She's the principal architect at Marina Tawasum Architects. In 2016, she won the world-renowned Aga Khan Award in, Ar in Architecture for the design of a mosque that I'm sure she's gonna show us today. That mosque uh, is located in Dhaka in Bangladesh. In 2020, Tabasum was listed by Prospect Magazine as the third greatest thinker for the COVID-19 era. And the magazine wrote, at the forefront of creating buildings in tune with their natural environments, this Bangladeshi architect is also embracing the design challenges posed by what we are collectively doing to the planet. 1995, Tabasum founded with Kashef Chaudhuri, the firm Urbana. This was an architectural practice also based in Dhaka. Urbana designed a number of award-winning projects in their 10 years together. In 2005, she established her own practice which is called Marina Tabasum Architects MTA, which is the principal architect. Her projects range from buildings to master plans and generally involve the notions of site, culture, and local history to counteract what she finds impersonal and confused in global architecture these days. Her Baila Roof Mosque built over the course of 12 years with a minuscule budget, distinguishes itself by the lack of iconography. Instead, the emphasis of this mosque is on materials, on space and light, and on its capacity to function not only as a place of worship, but also as a meeting room, as a school, and as a playground for an undeserved community on the periphery of the city of Dhaka. Since 2005, Tabasum has been invited uh, as a visiting professor at Brack University, where she has also taught courses on contemporary South Asian architecture. She also conducts undergraduate studios at the University of Asia Pacific, design studios at Harvard University, and is currently an, a faculty member of the Delft Global Housing Studio online this year. She has given lectures and presentations at a number of other educational institutions and conferences. And she has been the director of academic programs at Bengal Institute for Architecture, Landscapes and Settlements since 2015. On behalf of the School of Architecture of the University of Miami and Technoglass, our sponsors, please let us welcome Marina Tabasum. Thank you, Jaime. That was really a nice introduction. Um, thank you in uh, Miami for this invitation. And uh, yeah, it's an absolute pleasure. Never been to Miami before. Uh, so, uh, you know, if this whole COVID crisis comes to an end, hopefully I will have a chance to come and visit the campus uh, uh, personally. So thank you for the invitation. I'll start my screen share.
Okay, so um, right. So I hope I'm visible. Um, so I'm starting this talk with this image that you see in front of you. Um, um, it was actually last year when we went into lockdown um, that all of a sudden, obviously a lot of things were coming to surface, um, which was already quite predominant in the earlier years, but we were not really focusing much. But when everything came to a standstill, all of a sudden we all came to realize that um, we have extracted too much, much more than we should have extracted from the earth without letting um, it take care or replenish uh, what was already extracted. Or let's say um, the, the disparity between the, <clears throat> the rich and the poor, the enormous disparity that just came into focus so much. And also the fact that there is uh, this imbalance in the nature uh, that is causing an existential crisis for the human beings, us in a way. So these things are somehow coming to surface and climate change all of a sudden has become the most important phenomena that we are all focusing on. And we realize that this is something we need to really work at. So instead of the Vitruvian man in the focus, I thought, you know, this is the time when nature should be in focus rather than a man. So this is what we did last year. Um, as you all know that this is Bangladesh map and, and in a way the sea level rise will be high along the Bay of Bengal, which is in the south of Bangladesh due to the change in the ocean current caused by rapid surface warming in the Indian Ocean. And it is expected that by 2050, there will be a meter rise in water. And which means actually 15 million people will be affected, which means they will be displaced and 17,000 square kilometer of land will be submerged. And we are already facing these uh, phenomena. To give you a bit of a background, um, Bangladesh is actually located in, a, in an area which, is, uh, which, is, which was formed um, predominantly by the progradation of the uh, Ganges estuary. So basically there are three major rivers, Ganges, Brahmaputra and Meghna that are converging and flushing into the Bay of Bengal. And while doing so creating this delta formation and this delta basically flushes onto the Bay of Bengal. And if you look at Bangladesh, it is more than a, more as a, a waterscape rather than a landscape. It's a, it's a labyrinth of waterways these are rivers, tributaries, ponds, and lakes, and all kinds of water forms that you can see. Um, it, it's rarely land, but it's all about water. And if you look closely, this is an image from NASA, um, 20 years of the movement of one of the rivers, which is the Ganges uh, and the Brahmaputra meeting, and then call it, and this is named as Podda and it meets Moigna, the other river. And you can see the movement of the water as it, as it moves along and how it changes it, its courses. And if you look much more closer, you see that the movement is actually causing this enormous erosion along the bank. The earth is very fragile in these areas and the water has a very strong current during the monsoon season. And because of that reason, uh, there is always erosion that's happening. And that has washed away many, many uh, small towns and villages and, and still causes to do so. So this is one of the major challenges and it is getting greater with the sea level rise. And you can imagine that this actually causes lots of um, people to lose their home, homesteads, land. Many people have become landless, um, moved to the, from the location to many different places. So there is an enormous amount of climate refugees um, uh, and, and, and moving to different places, becoming displaced.
And on the other hand, uh, as the river changes courses, new sandbed arises in the, in the riverbeds. And so what happens is you see these uh, new formations that are uh, coming up in, in the riverbeds. And in a way, I find Anuradha Mathur and Dilip Dakunha's take on this quite uh, appropriate because it is not really land, but it is wetness and it is everywhere. You cannot really call it a land, but it is a mixture of land and water in an, a very intertwined way uh, of living. So why is it so predominant? So to, just to give you a little background of Bangladesh's history, geoformation history. So um, if you see in this map, the old map from the 1760, uh, 76, uh, the Brahmaputra River had a different course, but during the uh, devastating Assam earthquake that was in um, 1950, the river actually changed its course from there and take, took another course, which then brought in an enormous flow of water from the Himalayas. So Bangladesh is actually located in the foothill of the Himalayas. So all the water that comes through Ganges and Brahmaputra are coming from uh, glacial waters coming down from the Himalayas to the Bay of Bengal and also rainwater. And so during the monsoon season, they really become full with water and the current is so enormous that they flow and creates this fragile landscape. And this is the Southern part of Bangladesh. As you see, the blue area in this map shows the active Delta, which means this is the uh, Delta, which is still active, meaning that it's constantly moving the, the images and the video that I showed you basically occurs in this uh, blue area. Whereas the other parts like this pink and the yellow areas, these are much more mature delta, which means these deltas do not move anymore. And during the dry season, uh, when there is not so much water, um, there's not much movement in the water, what happens is due to the tide dominance, the water goes back into the system as the tide increases the water. And so it creates a backflow and then it enters into the Eastern Asturian system, creating these sandbeds. So this emergence and, and in a way erosion is a constant play in the, in the landscape. So it's a very dynamic, fluid landscape. And so what happens uh, in these areas is that people constantly move. They're constantly on the move as the land and the river shifts. Uh, people move from one location and it's not just people moving, it's the entire village or the entire small town moves from one location to another location. So in one of our research works for the Sharjah Triennial, which was in 2019, end of 2019, 2020, we actually um, uh, researched and followed a few of these um, narratives and stories where we looked into how people live and how they move. So we've located some of these houses and some of these uh, villages that have moved from one location to another location. And what is quite interesting in this whole uh, movement is that they have come up with this idea of a flat pack system of a vernacular uh, architecture where the entire house is a, is a flat pack system where the, the posts and beams are basically wooden structure, uh, frames of facades, which you can just take down. And when they uh, can feel that the, the, the land will be er eroding soon, that the bank erosion will happen, they basically take down their houses and then put it on a boat or a cart or even a van and then move it uh, to a different safer location where they can, if they find a new a place to, to house their building, they reassemble it. So this disassembly and reassembly is a part of the whole system uh, as people constantly move. So the house also moves with them. So if you see um, in these areas, especially along the Brahmaputra and, and Ganges, along up to the Bay of Bengal, the coastal areas, there are markets where you can go and buy these houses. So here you see in the video is one of these uh, marketplaces like a shop where you can go and order a house and they can come and build it for you. And we found many houses uh, in these areas uh, where 
you know, one house has moved seven different locations in its lifetime. So if a house is a 60 year old house, it has moved from one location to another seven different times. So for the Sharjah Architecture Triennial, we decided to buy three of these houses and house them in this location. This, the image that you see here, this is a courtyard in an abandoned school, uh, which was turned into the venue for the triennial. Uh, and we were given this courtyard to house uh, the houses that we bought from Bangladesh and shipped it to Sharjah and we uh, placed it there. So this here you see on the left side is the houses in their own context. And uh, on the right side, you see the uh, houses that we bought and we built um, in the context of the Sharjah Triennial. And we, uh, the entire research that we did, which was on the futures of future of, uh, sorry, um, uh, future of the next generation. Um, and we talked about the inheritance of the land and how people move. Uh, so this was all uh, showcased in these houses. So we bought three houses and three architects and a carpenter from Bangladesh and from our office went and actually built these three houses or assembled them um, in this location. So these are the houses that you see. So generally uh, those people who are, let's say a bit well off or who has some money can buy these houses or you know, relocate them. But when people become landless and there is quite a lot of people who are landless, uh, who cannot afford to build such a beautiful house. This is a house which one house would cost around uh, $3,000 to $4,000. And not everybody in Bangladesh can afford to buy or make a house like this. So if you see, this is an image which shows the houses in the Sharjah, context of Sharjah. You see the city at the background. So um, what we did uh, after that triennial experience and the research, while we were sitting at, in our office, pretty much inactive last year when we didn't have much work to do, as most of the projects were um, stalled in many ways, construction stopped, we decided to work on this idea of a modular mobile house uh, for the people who become landless and who doesn't have any place to move or doesn't have a house. Uh, so if we could provide them with something which is easy to move, easy to uh, assemble and disassemble and they can take it with them while they are moving somewhere. So we came up with this idea of a modular mobile house, which we call Kudi Bari. Kudi means tiny or small and how, uh, Bari means house. So it's a tiny house in that sense. And it costs about, if you see all the components, it costs about uh, 200 US dollars altogether. So it's basically a space frame structure that we built and then we have bamboos and steel joints and the steel joints are connecting them. And then you have the sheet roof and the facades could be anything, uh, whatever the materials are available. So this is what was our idea that you can actually create an entire village, uh, if you like, with this idea of uh, modular houses um, with bamboo and steel joints and whatever basically material is available on site or around the site, so you can source it from there. Uh, so this was our first uh, modular mobile house, which we uh, kind of a, built a model of um, in Intaka at one of the sites to see whether it was stable enough, whether the scale was enough for a family. So there are two different levels, as you see here, there's a ladder which takes you up and then the upper level one can sleep in the night and during the day they can have their daily activities in the lower level. So this is what we built. And here you see the team of builders on the left side. All, these are all done by architects in our office. So our architects are very hands-on. So they are building it themselves, trying out all different materials as you see here. So once we were satisfied that yes, this is a stable structure and we can work with this, we then took it to the, to the uh, areas where we did our research. So we uh, fixed it on one of, the, one of the sand beds. So this you see here is one of those sand beds which we studied and they are always on the move. So this is a sand bed which is about eight years old. 
And when a sand bed becomes a little mature, like eight to 10 years, that's when people start to move in and then start to live there and start cultivation. And it's a very fertile ground. So people generally move. Uh, this particular sand bed, which in our own language, we call them chore. So this chore doesn't have any um, ownership in that sense because it's in the middle of the river. So any chore that comes up in the riverbed, which has no ownership or nobody claims it, it becomes government property. So the government, uh, so the people who live here uh, gives a small token sum of money to the local government and then they can live here for uh, as, as long as this sunbed would uh, be there. So you never know when this is going to wash away. So you know, as long as it's there, people just go and live there, make their houses. So if you see, there is this tiny little house. Uh, that's one of the houses that we built. And that uh, on the horizon that you see, that is the actual river where you do not see any horizon. It's all about the water. So that's the enormousness or the, or the you know, this is the size and the scale of the water and the, and the river that is. And this little channel that you see is just a channel of or part of the river. So this is one of our sites. And uh, from the top, this is just, you know, like two, one week back when I was there also, we were, the, especially, in fact, my office architects, a team of our office architects who work on this project are still on site. They're also building, we have now started building about eight houses. So uh, they are on site building these houses. So this is one of the houses that we've built. Um, as you see here, and here's one toilet um, and, and the house over here. So this was the first house that we built. Um, so this was the original house that belonged to one of the people's, um, Abul Hussein, his name, uh, a very young guy with a, a very small family, a husband, wife, and a, and a, and a son, basically, um, he just doesn't need a lot of space. So what we decided to do is it's a kind of a process of co-creation where we give them the structure, which is about $200. And we try to get these funds from different sources. And so um, this, is, this structure with the roof costs about $200. And the toilet is about uh, 1,500, 200, 2,000 is about, I don't know, uh, $50 maximum. So that's the toilet. And so basically, uh, we built them the structure, the lower part, he will build on his own. So he will dismantle this house and the facade that you see here, that's made out of leaf. So he'll probably cover this uh, with the facade that he has in this uh, place. So the upper level is for him to sleep and the lower level could be the daily activity. So this is Teresa, one of our uh, very, uh, our friend and, and filmmaker. So she kind of follows us, uh, follows the story of the Kudibari project. So she goes with us uh, in many places. So you see the details here. So these are all leaf that are available on the chore because these areas are so difficult to access that there is hardly any material that is there. So a lot of things have to be brought in from mainland except for the facade materials. And so this is the second house. So the first house is here that you see a little bit. And this is the second house, which is two modules together. So this family has, a, has a six children, so they need a bigger house. So we gave them two modules and then with a stair in the middle so that they can have two levels. Um, and so this is one of the families that you see here. And uh, the, in the chore, there is no school. So the children cannot go to school. And especially with the COVID situation, there is no way of uh, even taking them to the, uh, to the mainland to go to a school. So basically they have no option, but they are so eager to learn. So we, buy, we bought them books um, during this, uh, on 26th of March, um, this uh, a few, few days back. It was our 50th, um, Inde uh, Independence Day. So we had a small celebration where we gave the children books and, and everything. And obviously uh, they're very interested and uh, to learn. And so you see images here of the architects who are working hands-on on site and also trying to create a connection with the children who are living there. 
Now, moving much more to the Western side, which is more the mature Delta. And the image that you see here is of Shundurban. Shundurban is uh, the largest mangrove forest in the world, which is close to the Bay of Bengal. And with the sea level rise, this, uh, uh, this entire ecosystem is under threat. And this is also the place where Royal Bengal Tigers, uh, home to the Royal Bengal Tigers. So basically this is under threat. So one of our sites were very close to uh, the Shundurbans, which is here, the Panigram Resort. So it's a resort project in the Delta. And this is a much more mature Delta. This is the Delta that doesn't really move. So uh, people here are much more um, agra agrarian kind of society where it's much more farming very rich land. So farming is predominant around these areas. And so this is our site, one of the river that goes by known as Kopotakpo River. And that's our site. Um, and, and basically um, it's, a, it's a very scenic, very flat land uh, as deltas are generally. So this is the river that you see that's going by the site and that's our site actually. And um, beautiful green farmland all around. And so when I first went there, um, this is probably my first connection, I would say, with, uh, with the Bangladesh, which is outside Dhaka. So I, I was born in Dhaka, I, I, I was brought up in the city, so, and I didn't have a village home where I would go and reconnect with villages, let's say. So when I was first time going to visit this site and I stayed there for a longer period of time, that was probably my first experience of being outside of Dhaka and really experiencing Bangladesh and the Delta itself. So it was quite a unique experience for me as an architect and as a journey because first time uh, I realized at that time, and it was in 2013, I realized that that uh, that that it is uniquely beautiful, and there is so much wisdom in living with nature. The symbiotic relationship that humans have with with nature, and 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 there is hardly any. I mean, it's almost like zero carbon footprint. Uh, that's how people live their lives in the villages. So that was quite unique for me, and and that's why you know I quite often read this uh, that it felt like a crime to invade this silence with the roaring noise of architecture. So I thought that the best way to do this project would be to understand the wisdom of the land and to build upon that and to learn from the land before I start to build anything or to put anything impose on it. So if you look at it, Delta is a very flat land so generally the act of building starts with digging a pond. So people generally dig a pond and taking the earth out of the pond and then creating a higher ground, which is a mound. And on the mound, they basically place their houses. So if you see here, you see the section that you have a pond and then the earth dug out of the pond is then created a mound and the houses are on top of it. And so the entire villages are absolutely uh, created like that. And a house basically has these different program. The program of a house has small rooms or huts and the kitchen and all the different uh, domestic animals and their small um, shades and everything. So basically this is what a household of a village home is like. And these different elements that you see, uh, the program of a house is actually then gathered around the courtyard. So each house has a courtyard and every element of the household is basically uh, in a way uh, clustered around the courtyard. And the courtyard are, are not really defined, uh, very distinctly defined, but they are kind of leaking one courtyard into the other courtyard. So it's a very communal social way of living together. Uh, in a community. So that communal living is quite interesting in the villages. And that's how the entire village is created. It's a, it's a, it's a collection of courtyards, let's say. So a potter's village would have a much, uh, you know, a squarish or a larger courtyard where they can 
dry their pots and potteries, whereas um, uh, a weaver's courtyard would be much more linear because they work with bamboo and bamboos need a longer place. So the courtyards become linear. So um, that's how the entire village is created. And that's quite unique and beautiful. And the material that they work with, obviously in these areas are mud because mud is the only material that they can build with that's sourced from the land and bamboo and maybe thatch or tin, corrugated tin roofing, whatever is available to them. So one interesting form that uh, was there, but you don't see that anymore is this beautiful roof form, which is uniquely Bengali. So this is a pitch roof, which is then curved. And the reason is it rains so much that uh, this, this shape actually allows water to drain out fast. So that's how uh, this came into being. So this is also known as the Bangla roof. And it was taken by the Mughals in some of their forts, which was used quite often. And even in our temples, we see this form being depicted, but you don't see this form anymore because now corrugated sheet has actually flooded the market. So nobody builds these thatch roofs anymore. So, you know, I thought that this, could, this project could have that revival of that kind of a roof form uh, that we can uh, try to bring back. So this is the site, as I was mentioning. And so we have a bridge. We thought of getting people off uh, close to the uh, bridge here and then giving them a boat ride to bring them to the site. Um, and then they can enjoy the entire journey of being at the site. And this is our master plan, as you see. So it's a meandering path. There's hardly, there won't be any, um, cars in, in the site. So this will be mostly walkable spaces. And, and the entire um, uh, master plan was done keeping the idea of hut in mind. So people can basically uh, stay in huts. And so the, uh, the material we chose was mud brick and thatch and basically um, bamboo and wood. And so these are the huts. Each is a single hut as you see, and then there are courtyards and each are connected with the other. So that's the, how we created the entire landscape. And the other thing we did is we invited the villagers since we became very close to them and we created a connection. So we, we asked the villagers to come and build it for us. So the villagers actually came and, and took part in building. And what we did is we engaged the younger generation, especially who are living in the villages like this young man you see here. So there are many of them who then became part of the project because uh, you know, most often these young men have a dream or aspiration to go to the cities and look for a job. And that becomes a very difficult path for them because it's not so easy, it's a, it's a struggle. So we thought you know, it would be much better if they can stay in their own uh, village and then uh, let the uh, you know, be a part of this whole process and then become part of the entire uh, uh, building process and also the resort once it goes into operation and also developing the craft and the skills that they already have. So these are the materials that we work with, sun-dried mud brick and uh, mud mortar. Uh, it was easy to build a process and, and we sourced the materials from the, from the local areas, the villagers working with bamboos. And that's the roof form, as I was mentioning, where we have this pitch roof, which is then curved and thatching. This thatch is a very unique form, but you don't see this anymore. There's hardly any people available who has the technique or knows the skill of weaving this thatch. Uh, so it was quite a difficult and a challenging process to bring it back. We have women working uh, on the site and they do really great plaster. So most of the houses in the villages are plastered by women. So you see here, one of the huts, uh, everybody after work, uh, chatting and spending some quality time. This is the, uh, this is the elevation on the riverside actually. So you don't see any architecture in that sense, architecture with a big A if I say, but uh, yeah, some huts. Uh, this is our organic garden and the huts as you see. 
this is a hut which has two rooms so one can have if a family comes they can have two rooms and so the entire thing is actually the, the details that you see everything is actually the villagers who came in and, and, and did whatever they generally do with their own houses. So, so that's also a quite interesting, surprising way of building and doing things. So after this, uh, this whole process of building was coming to a completion, we then decided that we need to keep this connection going with the villagers. So that's how we started this project, which we call Panigram Community Initiative where we work with the villagers to improve their own uh, social and environmental conditions. So what we do is we do craft, craft diversification workshops where they can diversify the, their own skills and, and create new products, which they can then sell to the uh, resort guests. Uh, we've created savings group where women save $1 uh, a week, everyone. Uh, so they have groups where they save these money to create their own little bank. From there, they can then um, lend money to themselves, whoever needs and for whatever reason. Uh, so it, it becomes a, a very interesting network of economic, uh, uh, yeah, a kind of a becoming free in a way, uh, financial freedom in many ways. And then we've also created this mapping and community groups where people generally um, you know, start working with their own villages. So here is one of the process you see, this is a, a project which is an hour's drive from our site and done with Hasibul Kubir and, and, and a group of community architects who actually took part uh, in this project where they started with mapping the process of you know, mapping the entire area or the villages and then making aspirational model with people and then from there creating their own houses. And, and so it's a process of co-creation and each house, the house that you see here is a two-story house with the toilet uh, is, is built with $1,500. It's a project in Jinaida. So this is the same technique that we followed um, in Panigram Resort for the villagers. And so the budget for the projects that we did were $2,000. Um, and which in a village language would be 3,000 a goat. And this is also the project that we, I, I, uh, I was, when I was teaching at Harvard GSD in 2017, my students had to work on these $2,000 home projects where um, uh, they went to the site in Panigram, they visited these uh, $1,500 homes uh, to understand what are the possibilities, the materials that are available, what are the costs and how you can redefine cost. And so, you know, the idea was that a budget cannot um, limit the possibilities of design. So, so that's how this entire project came into being. So the students tried out all different kinds of materials that are available, bamboos, brick and mud, everything that was on site available. So they worked on it. They also worked with the clients. They had five different clients to work with to understand their aspirations because their aspiration was very important in the entire process. So to understand that and then to create based on their ideas. And so here you see students you know, connecting with the clients and in GSD, the uh, review and then here on the site again back when we were making a small exhibition for the villagers to see what the students have come up with. This is one of the students work for a potter's, uh, a potter, his house, you see this is, and uh, the students had to prove uh, with a complete uh, list of items and the cost that this was possible within $2,000. This is another potter's house. This is a bamboo weaver's house. Uh, this is a house that was for three ladies. There was no male member in the family. So the women had to have a small tea stall where they could start earning money. So that's what also the students had to keep in mind. So, um, so this was a book, book report that uh, GSD came up with, the $2,000 home co-creating in the Bengal Delta. So that was the studio work. So in Venice Biennale, I took this entire idea of wisdom, wisdom of the land where, 
you know, especially in our time when we are so flooded with data and information and then knowledge and wisdom, where does wisdom play uh, its role? It was something I needed, I kind of thought of focusing on. So, and I thought that, you know, when we had this, uh, the curators had the idea of free space and, and they talked about going beyond the visual choreographing the daily life. I thought wisdom of the land could also focus on the daily life that goes around the courtyard of a Bengali hut. So I decided to create a courtyard of a Bengali hut. So this was our site that we were given in Arsenale in Venice. That was the site. And uh, in the site, we created this courtyard where we brought in all different elements that you see in a Bengali hut. And they were all placed uh, in a, in a very casual, random manner, and, and to create a, a look of that, what actually happens in courtyards. So this is, uh, so what we did is we went from different villages and sourced all these materials. Those are still in use uh, uh, in, in a daily household in a village. So this is a granary, as you see. And, and so there's, these are all different elements that you see in the courtyards or you know, used by people in their daily life. So this is what our installation turned out. So we basically worked with steel wires, uh, creating the houses with steel. So the architecture became invisible and the entire idea of living with land and naturally and this symbiotic relationship of human and nature became focused where every element was sourced from nature. So that's what was our focus. So this is uh, the installation of a Bengali courtyard. So you see all these elements, this is a grinder, this is, a, this is the stove, that's a bed, that's a boat. So really fascinating elements. So at the end, we donated all these elements to uh, the natural building lab of TU Berlin. So this is again on the Eastern side of the Bay of Bengal. And this is, this is the Bay of Bengal, as you see on the left. And this is a site which we, where we had to design a building uh, within 2.5 kilometer of the Bay of Bengal. And if you, to give you a bit of a history of this land, um, in 1991, there was a severe cyclone, which was about a category five hurricane. And during that time, since there was no embankment, uh, the water surge was about 20 feet high. And there was about 1 million homesteads that were washed away. And then 138,000 people lost their lives. And this area where our site is located, named Bashkali, that area alone had 40,000 people uh, were killed in that area. So uh, after this cyclone in 1991, the government built this red line, which is an embankment. And um, the, our client who are from that area decided to build a mosque and a health hub because there is no health facilities around this area. So they decided to create a health hub, which would be also connected with the mosque. And we as architects thought that, you know, if it is a mosque, mosques generally have a clean open space. There's no furniture in that sense. So this could also act as a cyclone shelter. So quite often, since people or the villagers live in very fragile homes, uh, when there is a cyclone approaching, uh, people move to a shelter, which is called a cyclone shelter, which is much more rigid and sturdy and and stable, so that's where people generally move. So we decided that this could also act as a cyclone shelter. So a mosque and a health hub, and, and so this was the program. So this is a Mughal mosque in Dhaka, which has a lower level, as you see here in the middle image, which is a place where generally people come and stay. And in the upper level is the mosque with the courtyard. And this on the right side, you see this is Louis Khan's um, mosque, uh, sorry, a hospital project in Dhaka, Bangladesh. Um, so we thought, you know, these are our inspirations and we brought them together and created this cyclone shelter. So generally cyclone shelters um, do not have any openings on the facade because when the storm surge comes, it generally breaks the glass and allows the wind to move in. 
So we decided to create these, um, this entire building in a way that they are, are broken into different components, like small pieces, like as you see here. So there are nine, 12 uh, individual blocks that, are, that can stand on their own. And if there is wind force coming in, it can just go through, pass through it and would not really uh, create any kind of difficulty. So that's how we decided to create that uh, build form here, as you see. So the lower level uh, here, as you see, this lower level would be the health hub where primary health facilities would be available to people. And in the upper level would be the mosque. And then there's again, another smaller level on the upper floor if they ever need to create something of a, an extension. So that's how we designed it. So if you see here in the ground level, this is the area where we have the health hub. So there's a central uh, sitting area and then all these rooms are for different facilities of uh, uh, primary healthcare. And on the upper level, this is the main mosque area. So you can enter here and there are all the other ancillary facilities are on the sides. That's the section, the building as I showed you. And if you go up, uh, and the upper level, there's just basically uh, the main mosque area. So this is the main mosque and that's the courtyard in the front. So this is a project which is now under construction. Tropic of Cancer goes through Bangladesh, as you see here, making it a subtropical climate. So we have a very uh, humid and hot summer and a very dry and a very mild kind of a winter. And so, the, the difference in temperature is never too high. <clears throat> so what you really need is a roof to cover yourself from the elements. And you can keep it open, as open as possible. So there is cross ventilation, there is enough. I think that also is quite, um, quite similar to probably the weather of Florida or Miami maybe, because I think it's also quite humid in that area. So it's similar in a way that you need to keep it open make the space breathe. So that breathability uh, of a space, the cross ventilation is very important for us as well. So this is one of the buildings not designed by me, but the, but the first, um, let's say modern architecture building in Bangladesh by Mazhar al-Islam in 1954. So this is also a very unique building for us. And in many ways, in many of my projects also, I have tried to use that idea of blurring the edge to create this connection, which is inside and outside becoming one, uh, to avail that idea of just being a pavilion uh, and no walls in a way. So that, that really works very well for us. And so there are all these different elements which really helps in this whole idea of airflow and how you can create um, a microclimate in a house, let's say with a courtyard. So here you see a courtyard that is helping uh, to create this environment where you create the airflow and a, and a nice environment. And in many of these other projects also, you'll see even in a 12 story, 15 story residential block where we try to open up the edges so that um, there is a way of creating this airflow. So the breathability of a building uh, is an absolute essence and importance. Here is that same building, uh, which is in the, on, the, on the highway right next to this really, uh, the north-south spine of Dhaka city in a way. Uh, in another project, which is now going to be in construction, uh, we tried to use this idea of a long veranda, which is also very much a part of our old architectural culture um, when we didn't have air conditioning in that sense. So people used to use these buffer spaces to, to condition the air in a way naturally, and then to let it come into the spaces so that it becomes cooler. So that those ideas are still valid. So in many ways, we try to emulate those ideas to, to use in our buildings. So here you see that the long veranda then wraps around the building to create this idea of a of a, of a building that can actually operate on its own without being dependent on air conditioning. So courtyards also are important factors, as you see here, that really creates that stack effect and airflow 
And so in many other projects, we've used this stack effect idea where you have a central larger space uh, like an atrium, which helps to uh, create this airflow uh, to make the building breathe. So this is one of those buildings, which was, this is a design for a embassy, a French German embassy building, which we designed, but was never built. This is a very small building also in the outskirts of Dhaka, where you also have this shaft in the center um, that creates that airflow movement. And a lot of spaces which are very pavilion-like, where you can really spend your days uh, being very connected to the nature. And as I was mentioning that, uh, you know, we do not have many luxury of many materials. It's a Delta, so we have earth. So generally people build their houses with mud. And if you want to make it a bit more permanent, you bake the earth and you create a uh, let's say brick. And then that's what you use for building your uh, permanent structure. So this is a monastery. So we have many monasteries, Buddhist monasteries in, in Bangladesh uh, dotted in many different areas. This is a monastery which is 300 BC old, but we have second century BC monastery too. Um, and so, you know, brick and terracotta is very much into a, a part of our culture. And we have these intricate terracotta works uh, in temples and in mosques. So brick is our material and we have really good brick masons. So quite often you see many of my projects also take this idea of working with local materials and local craftsmanship and handmade uh, imperfections are something very common. Uh, everything is handmade in a way, including 12 story, 13 story buildings to small buildings, everything is handmade. So we create a very interesting connection with the people who work with us they do not understand drawings in that sense. So, you know, in many ways, our uh, construction industry is also very informal rather than a very formal kind of a way. So it's a much more about the connection and the relationship that is created with people you work with over years. And so, you know, it's quite often, it's about being on site and trying out different materials rather than just giving drawings and then expecting something will come out of it. So this is the city of Dhaka. And as you see here, uh, it's a, one of the fastest growing cities in the world. And um, yeah, so I'll just go very quickly with two projects. I know I'm running out of time, but just very quickly. So this is Dhaka. It's like any other cities um, uh, in Asia where there is a, a formal, informal side by side. And it is one of the fastest growing and one of the densest cities in the world. So it is also, again, quite a challenging city, very tough city in a way. There is also chaos, but there is also, again, order in chaos as well in the city of Dhaka. So one of these projects is the Museum of Independence that we designed. This was one of my first projects in my life in a way. I was just graduated. Um, I graduated in 1995 and in 1997, this was the project that we won in a competition and then we built it. So it's, it was the independence monument. And to, just to give you a very brief background on Bangladesh's history, Bangladesh was part of the Indian subcontinent, which was part of the British colonial empire. And then when the British colonial empire left in 1947, uh, Indian subcontinent divided into three different parts two parts together became Pakistan, which was the East Pakistan and the West Pakistan. Bangladesh was the East Pakistan. And between East and West Pakistan was India, uh, the country India. So this was a very weird division. I don't know uh, how they came up with it based on religious uh, religion, of course, that uh, East and West Pakistan had majority Muslims. So, uh, and also there was a forced mass, mass migration that happened during that time. So it's a very, difficult uh, history of this partition. And then uh, between 47 to 1971, it was a bit of a, quite a struggle between the East and the West, Pakistan. And then finally in 1971, Bangladesh uh, wanted to become free and become a free nation. So that's when East Pakistan became Bangladesh. And there was a nine month long war. And from the war, then we became free at the end in 1971, uh, December. 
So that is the history of Bangladesh and the independence monument and the museum is actually commemorating those uh, years of struggle and also the war. So this is a, a, in a way a, a, a ground which is very much um, within the city of Dhaka, but a very rare green park areas. So to build a museum in that area was a challenge that, you know, how can you build a building within a park? So we decided to took it below grade, as you see here, you just see a plaza and the museum has been taken below grade under the, um, under the plaza. So the plaza is actually the only thing that you see in the park and the tower of independence, which you see at the end and a reflecting pool and an approach to the plaza. So we just tried to keep the footprint to the minimum, as you see here in the section, that's the museum below grade and that's the tower of independence. Here are all the different components. So as I said that we, and this is the plan actually, we're on the ground level uh, uh, below grade where we have the museum or the visual room, that's the main museum area, the ramps that take you down. I'll just go very quickly with the images. This project, which was um, uh, commissioned to us in 1997, was finally finished in 2013. So that took us 16 years to finish. So these are actually all the different historical events that are printed on glass. This is the area where we have all the images of genocide and killing. And then you come into the central chamber where there is a water column going down. This was designed in 1997, as I mentioned, and then finished in 2013. And from the museum, you basically go up the ramp and then you come to the tower, which is made out of glass, basically stacks of glass cladded onto a, a space frame structure. This was actually designed as a tower of light. So it's actually lit from the outside and in the night it glows like a beacon of hope for a young nation which is only 50 years old. I'll finish with the mosque very quickly. So this is the city of Dhaka and on the northern end of the city is you see that blue dot, that's the main mosque uh, site. And this area has been a very agrarian land but very fast with the rapid growth of the city became a settlement very quickly. So when I was given this project in, 19, uh, in 2006 by my grandmother, she, was, uh, she uh, owned a piece of land here and she um, commissioned me for this project. She donated her land to the mosque. And so um, what I tried to do is go back to the history of what was mosque, especially in Islam, what was, uh, what was it that was intended as a mosque? instead of starting from what you see as a mosque. And if you look into the history of mosque, it was basically the house form that was elongated during the prophet's time to create this space where people can congregate. And the congregation was not only for the, for the act of prayer, but it was also for different kind of gatherings, social, communal, um, administrative, judicial, all kinds of different uh, activities took place in mosques. And as Islam moved from the Arabian Peninsula to the east to the west, it took many different forms, as you see here, in different places, it, it took or adapted to the culture of construction, culture of uh, the history and the, and the you know, climate and everything. So even in our own location, this is the kind of mosque we had in Bengal, the first authentic mosque form that you see, basically, I tried to bring back that idea to reconnect with the very authentic mosque form. And this is what you see in the city now, really uh, stacks of floor and there is no architecture in that sense. And this is the kind of symbols that has become really something that makes you question, do you really need that? So I decided to really focus on the idea of spirituality more as a connection with the divine and so this is the site. And as you know, Muslims pray in a certain direction, which is Mecca. And the way my site was, it created a 13 degree shift. Um, so I needed to create that shift so that the prayer hall then shifted 13 degrees. 
And to accommodate that shift, I introduced a circular drum in the middle, as you see here. And I created these open spaces, as I mentioned, that these volumes or stacks, where, which really helps to create this ventilation. And obviously taking idea from the old architecture, this became my conceptual drawing for the mosque. So the basic main prayer hall is a, a span, large span concrete structure and the uh, entire uh, building is then wrapped around with a brick architecture. So that's what it is. Uh, we have porous uh, porosity in the facades so that it acts uh, to create this breathing wall. So it breathes, as you see, the city is growing all around it and that's the main mosque. So at one point it will not be visible anymore because all the buildings will come up. So it was important for us to, to focus more within the building than outside of the building. So that's why you see a lot of uh, work with light um, so that we could uh, create that space which is, uh, has that quality of spirituality within it. That's the open to sky space uh, through which you get the light and also the ventilation. So this is the main prayer hall and light is the main ornament of the space. Uh, the project had very little budget. So, you know, light became its adornment and it, it, it was for free in a way. So that was the basic idea. So I will finish it here. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry that I overstepped my time. <laughs> Let's hope we can have some conversation. Sorry about that. No, no, you you did really well with the time. <laughs> uh, so we're going to start with Charlotte. Yeah. Uh, well, um, Marina, uh, very happy to meet you and and thank you very much for the wonderful lecture. Um, I think it was uh, for me super impressive how you described and illustrated the, the landscape or the waterscape, as you mentioned, in all its fragility. Um, and, it, and it seems very clear that, that the ambition in every project is, is somehow more than just architecture with the capital A, as you say. So every project is somehow also a social project, the ecological project, uh, but then creating, of course, also very beautiful architecture. Uh, I, I have one little question and then, uh, not, I mean, two, two little questions. The one, probably one that you hear a lot uh, um, related to Louis Kahn. So actually I had the chance to visit Dhaka, but that was, I think, unfortunately at a time when none of your projects were built. Um, it must have been like 10 or 15 years ago. I, uh, yeah, uh, one gets older, but um, I remember um, because I had the chance, Florian, my husband, I think you met him at ETH two years ago, uh, did a PhD on, on Louis Kahn's work. And I remember a lot seeing um, uh, the National Assembly building, for me, it was quite impressive uh, as a contrast to the chaos of, of Dhaka. Of course, for a European, Dhaka is really chaotic, <laughs> even if you say so. Uh, and also, but I also remember being super impressed of these riverbanks, these unfortified riverbanks, which for a European is something that one never sees. Um, so I was just curious to hear a little bit, I mean, in some of your work, there clearly seems to be an echo of Khan's work, but maybe to hear, hear you, your, your memories of that project. Uh, and the second part, I already say, it, I'm just curious to hear, um, you, you speak also a lot of climate change and all the challenges that we encounter these days, and maybe what is your thought or uh, your wisdom um, in, in what is the role of the architect or the role of the discipline of architecture within that, because uh, I see that more and more the questions become so so complex uh, that there's a tendency uh, to, to be very technocratic or that it becomes almost more a question of engineering. And, and, and in that, I think it's, it, I would be really curious to hear what you think is the role of the architect or, or architecture. Right, well, Khan. <laughs> um, you know, I grew up uh, seeing that building. So, you know, from my very childhood, um, when I was uh, still going to my school, 
Um, so the first time I went to that building was, I think I was in my grade 10 and the building was uh, towards completion. And one of my friend's father was, uh, was an engineer uh, working in the public works department. And he somehow arranged this uh, visit for us kids to go and see the building. And that was the first time I was inside. And in a way, it, it did have a very captivating, uh, especially the ambulatory, the light that comes into that space is so magical and nothing I could relate to uh, in my own growing up years. So that was very different, nothing that I have experienced before. So that stuck with me. And then when I was in, as a student of architecture, obviously you, you've, I've been to that building so many times that the building actually became a teacher in many ways. Um, I've never met Khan. <laughs> the only connection to Khan would be um, the, the, his talks and you know whatever you read about him or the buildings that I've visited in the US or even in India or you know. So um, the buildings have taught a lot, but I think especially the building here in Bangladesh um, about light, about this whole idea of, you know, how, how silence, building can become silent, but at the same time be so powerfully present. So all these things, I think, um, came from Khan in many ways. So I do have, uh, yeah, a certain kind of uh, uh, influence, I would say, inspiration from Khan's work. So I think it's quite um, visible. <laughs> So there's no point in fighting that. Um, in terms of, um, yeah, climate change and, and yeah. So this is something I think uh, for me also very new in a way that when I started working in that resort project was the first time, as I mentioned that my first connection with the villages and <clears throat> how people live so symbiotically. But, the idea that um, you know uh, nowadays, especially with this COVID crisis, things are becoming so much more apparent that this crisis uh, is 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 basically a form of showing the imbalance in in the way we live our lives. So the existential crisis that we are facing, and I think the 21st century, or at least the first few decades of 21st century, will be about bringing balance back. And that balance definitely will also be a part of architecture. So I think as a university or as a pedagogical understanding, we should also be looking into these ideas. And I think it's very important for all uh, schools of architectures in the academia that we start talking about these things, especially if you see the, the amount of waste that are being created by the construction industry, let's say, I mean, uh, it is alarming to know or to think that, that we consume concrete more than we consume food. That's, that's unbelievable. So, you know, is that natural? And then the amount of concrete that we use, and, you know, it, it is quite fascinating to see that, um, that a ton of concrete, to create a ton of concrete, basically the amount of carbon dioxide that is uh, emitted uh, into the atmosphere it takes 40 years for a tree to basically bring it to balance. So the and this whole ex idea of extraction and the amount of waste that is being created, what do we do with this? So that I think is an important factor that we need to address. It could be through engineering, it could be through you know design by design in whatever form we need to address these issues and in many ways, I think that should be our new vernacular um, using the waste because waste is also our source of material and how you can use that. So I, I kind of think of this as our new vernacular where you address these issues which are very local and, 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 and you know, something that needs to be addressed. So we are not thinking about closing this gap or closing this cycle, this anthropogenic cycle of materials. So this material flow and all these things needs to be um, really thought carefully, uh, responsibly. And so that's why I think that's, uh, that's one of the most important factors um, in our 21st century, um, in our practice and also in academia that needs to be addressed. Th thank you so much. 
Yeah, thank you so much for your presentation. And, and I think um, kind of a, a comment sort of going off on, on this idea of the, of the ecology, I really like um, the way you kind of positioned yourself in, in kind of Dilip de Kuna's wetness in a way where these boundaries that we, we think are very certain are actually very much in flux. And I thought that mo the modular houses start to respond to this sort of um, unarticulation, unarticulation of these boundaries. Um, I had sort of two questions. Um, one, I think more on the formal side and, and one a little bit more about sort of your process. Um, so in his perspective essay, Kenneth Frampton sort of coins the, the term critical regionalism, which I think describes an architecture that has an interest in the sort of cultures and the materials of place. And I think it's an attitude that, I, even though this essay was, was from a while ago, I, it's an attitude that I find relevant today and, and a mode by which I think you operate within. Um, so I'm sort of taken aback at your sort of understanding of place and, and context, but it's these like deep investigations of typology, whether the mosque or the home, um, and of the building tectonics of the place. Um, and yet the architecture feels quite contemporary. I think you really do engage form and you do in, engage geometric organizations, um, sort of the circle and the nine square grid. Um, so how do you find a balance of, of working within this, this deep vernacular tradition with perhaps a more global discourse of architecture? Because I think you, you find a, a very precise balance between the two and you seem to extract sort of um, the correct amounts of both. Well, Thank you. <laughs> that was really nice. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think uh, Kenneth Frampton's Critical Regionalism essay had a lot to do with uh, the way I shaped my practice in a way. Um, uh, because when I read that essay, it somehow kind of uh, came to me like a revelation in a way that this is it, you know. You need to bring a balance between, you know, you have two cultures. One is your local culture, and then there is the universal culture where we all live. And, and so basically how you bring that balance and that balance is what your, what actually my entire architecture practice has been all about. That where you find that right balance. And it depends on project to project, you know, not every project has the same balance. Each project has its own uniqueness and a unique um, you know, way of uh, dealing with it. So basically uh, it depends on which project you're working on and where to, where to get that balance right. So yeah, I think I, I try to do that in everything. So mainly you know, when, you, when, you, when you focus on the climate um, and the geography and, the, and, and as I mentioned that, history or historical references. These are all about the localness. And then the universality is about the geometry and the language of architecture in many ways. This, the light that you bring in or the spaces that you go through, those are far more universal in many ways. So, so you know, I think that's how the, the balance is brought uh, to the projects. But then again, when you go to the resort, it's a very, uh, very local in a way, right? Uh, you see mud architecture. And when I was doing that project, I was quite um, afraid in a way. I was thinking that I would be criticized heavily for being so vernacular. I, I was very conscious to not become very pastiche in a way, you know, that I do not emulate something from the past, but I am taking elements from the past, but trying to make it much more contemporary that it does not feel that I am basically being overly nostalgic in a way. So that nostalgia had to be um, addressed critically so that you are not pastiche or, or you know, nostalgic, but you are taking an essence and then, and then bringing it to a place where it is of this time. So time is important in that sense. So, so those are the factors I think you need to be very cautious and you know, make your moves very carefully so that you do not uh, you know, lose that balance. So yeah. It before is before Melody, Melody asked the second question, I'm, I've been getting a, a lot of uh, direct messages and I would like to read one from a former professor at the School of Architecture, John Onyango, who mm -hmm. questions what is the reaction of the locals 
when you suggested designs that rely on traditional mud and touch materials in the Delta in relation to the ideas of modernity and progress? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, yeah, so when we are building, let's say for the villagers, you've seen that we use brick. We haven't uh, uh, tried, we did not try to build their houses with mud because you know, it's a very social thing. People don't want to build with mud in the villages anymore because they want to move uh, economically to the second stage of their, you know, in that sense, progress. So in many ways, uh, yeah, we tried, we've, we've talked to them. So in a process of co-creation, you cannot push or impose things on people. You have to listen to them. And quite often the idea is, you know, we want to build with brick. But the idea is that they do not have the knowledge of building with brick. They are very good with mud, but they do not know how to build with brick. That's where we architects have that knowledge. And so we could give them a better understanding of the material and a better design. So that's how when we co-create with villagers, we uh, actually give them what they want. So you'll see that we did not, when we worked with the villagers, it was all brick buildings in that sense, especially in the deltas, yeah. Thank you, Melody. Uh, yeah, I think that's this is kind of a, a perfect sort of segue to what I was gonna, I wanted to kind of talk about, you know, I think your work also has quite a sense of purpose and a, and a mission. I think you make very sort of specific decisions about the type of practice you want to have and the type of work you want to engage in. Um, you've said that architecture is not a commodity and I think this pandemic has kind of highlighted that uh, condition. Um, and I think you sort of represent an interesting sort of working model that resists certain forces. So, and also in, in several projects, you sort of extended the boundaries or, of the role of the architect by engaging the community, involving craftspeople, like you said, um, to develop interesting building techniques or new building techniques, but you've also um, engaged communities so they have a sense of ownership over specific projects, particularly the mosque and the and the resort that you were saying. Um, so one, how have you managed to kind of remain engaged within this mission? Because I think it's it's quite difficult. And and second, how has this engagement with communities maybe changed your thinking about architecture or your process of creating architecture? Yeah, I think you know it's a Every project that we design, we try to keep that idea in mind that how, how can we engage people, especially for those who are we, who we are building for. So, you know, sense of ownership grows when you engage people or, you know, through the process. So the process, you need to design the process first. So when we design the process, definitely engaging people becomes a major part of the whole idea. And not just the people who we are building it for, but also craftspeople, so that we can revive certain crafts which are kind of going missing, or even reviving components of a building or architecture which used to work really well before the air conditioning era, or let's say elevator era, or things like that. So you know how you can bring back those um, wisdom that were there, but it's not there. So these are the criteria we keep on going back to. Uh, to be able to revive in a much more modern and a contemporary way, which can, you know, which really works even these days. So those are certain things that we, it's kind of embedded in the practice. That's how we practice in a way. And you'll see a lot of hands-on also, because I think architects need to work hands-on. If you want to build something, a desk-bound architect is not an architect to me. <laughs> you have to know the material you work with, you have to hold it in your hand and you have to be able to build it. And only then you can create something which is relevant and you'll be able to make the best possible use of a material which you work with. So yeah, I mean, um, that's how the entire thing works. I totally forgot your question, which you were asking me. So. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, Melody. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, Dean El Huri. Technoglass for allowing us to have a fascinating lunch hour uh, from Bangladesh. And uh, please stay tuned for next year's Technoglass lecture series. Uh, we appreciate that you join us today. Uh, I, we know, I mean, how hard it is at this time. And we hope to see you in the fall 
again. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank everyone. You. Bye. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. <laughs>